Welcome to another episode of the Doctors and Dollars podcast, where we discuss health insights and wealth secrets. I'm your host, Nate Crannell, joined today by Dr. Jay Shaw. Dr. Shaw is a cardiologist and chief medical officer for medical device company, Octia. He completed his residency at Massachusetts General Hospital and fellowship in cardiovascular diseases at Washington University in St. Louis. He built a successful cardiology practice from the ground up in Portland, Oregon, leading the overall umbrella organization of 110 physicians and 600 employees. He was then recruited to the Mayo Clinic to build a complex thoracic aortic disease program, which he started, built, and ran for over three years. Two years ago, he began his role at Actia, where he leads across commercial, product, strategy, and R&D functions. Given the breadth of experience, he has also started consulting across the healthcare ecosystem. He continues to practice cardiology and resides in Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome to the show, Dr. Shaw. Thanks very much for having me, Nate. It's great to be here. Yeah, what's going well today? Uh, not much, just enjoying the holidays a little bit uh, with family and uh, and the slow week. It's been good. You bet. Didn't uh, overindulge yourself with, with food and beverage? Oh, I did. <laughs> for oh, sure. yeah. <laughs> <That's what laughs> for sure. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, is- for sure. This is that lull in between uh, in Christmas and New Year's uh, of 2023, yeah. where we, we were talking offline, where you just kind of, it's free week. You're, you're available if, if somebody needs to ask you questions, but y- yeah, it, it's just kind of that, yeah. that free time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been, it's been a good, good holiday season for me. Yeah. Are you guys getting snow out there? We just got a little bit of snow last night. No, not at all. Not it's unseasonably that... warm and Man. yeah. Yeah, I always tell people th- those who think that global warming is not real, I would, <laughs> I would implore them to to look at the the temperatures of November and December in Iowa over the last um, three or four years, and it has been crazy yeah. warm. I think yeah. I, I don't remember last That's time we had rare. a white Christmas. Yeah, it's pretty rare. I mean, nowadays, <laughs> I mean, so we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully, get you some bet. get some snow. Yeah. Well, you're pretty familiar with the northeast part of our country, so you completed your residency at Mass General Hospital. Tell me what attracted you to internal medicine in Boston and eventually cardiovascular disease at, at Washington University for your fellowship. Yeah, I, so I did my medical school in the Midwest. I grew up in St. Louis and then I did my medical school in Kansas City, University of Missouri awesome. in Kansas yeah. City. And, you know, by by luck and, and some, some degree of hard work and, and stuff, I had an opportunity to go to Mass General for internal medicine. I actually had no real idea about what Mass General was all about. I just knew I wanted to uh, move to the East Coast uh, or the West Coast uh, at that time in my life. And most specifically, uh, (laughs) to be very honest, to find a girl. And and that's really what I, (laughs) that's what prompted my move to the Boston area, you know, obviously in tandem with getting this uh, amazing spot at, at Mass General, which did change my life. I did find my girl and I married her and, and we met in residency as, as many of us do in medicine. And, uh, but, but certainly was a life changing experience overall, uh, being a resident there just with the type of people that I started coming across and, and sort of working with, and I had never experienced sort of that sort of those disparate aspects of medicine as kind of came together in the internal medicine residency at Massachusetts General Hospital. You know, people who had led NGOs in Africa for five years were now my co-residents or people who had invented a small molecule and sold it to the government of Singapore, you know, was my junior resident. It's just sort of completely different than my um, sort of initial start in medicine. And it really opened my eyes to the many, many different paths um, that exist in, in the medical field. And, and th- that, that was a very much a life-changing experience. Absolutely. Do you feel like, um, I mean, obviously you have the, the Harvard name behind a lot of that, but do you feel like, not necessarily just the people, because some of the people you just described sound fascinating and interesting, yeah. not just people, but some of the opportunities that you can have then coming out of that residency, do, does that just kind of open the door being at Mass General versus a you know, anywhere else it, in the country. Yeah, it, it does. It does. There's no, there's no doubt about it. You know, it, it, we know in life, a lot of things happen because of uh, names or pedigrees or sort of recognition of certain brands and, and Massachusetts General Hospital, um, it certainly carries that brand. And so, yes, lots of, lots of doors have opened because of it. I will say also that the the community that 
sort of you become a part of, you know, even after many years after leaving uh, Mass General always exists. And it's sort of the similar effect of a very high level alumni network, I would say, you know, similar to universities uh, that, you know, you, you're always a part of that community. You always have, you know, once you've gone through it, you always have that sort of uh, recognition. And, and now to this day, you now 15 plus years later, when I reach out to people who I haven't spoken to either ever or in many, many years and say, hey, I was a resident Mass General and you were as well, you know, would, are you willing to talk or do you, do you, you know, do you have five minutes? Always, always answers. And, and so that, that speaks volumes about sort of the camar- uh, camaraderie and sort of the you know, sort of brotherhood of, of that uh, institution. For sure. So you went internal medicine while you're there. What attracted you to kind of the, the cardiovascular side of medicine, uh, which ultimately led you going to Washington University? Back yeah. Back I really liked the idea. So I'd always wanted to, to, to be a doctor, kind of be like a, uh, uh, you know, not a researcher, not an imaging. I like being in front of people. I like talking to people. I like building relationships. So cardiology is one of those specialties where you can have that long-term relationship with patients and their families. I also really like the many sort of therapeutic aspects about cardiovascular disease. We, we have a lot of good treatments for known diseases. And there was a lot of variety. I didn't really know I wanted to do this sort of narrow subset of cardiology or one or the other. But all were, all are open in cardiology. You can be kind of more procedurally focused. You can be sort of a generalist. You can be uh, more imaging uh, type focused. So you could kind of do many different things within the umbrella of cardiology. And so the opportunities were still fairly large, even though you were deciding uh, a subspecialty, you could still, you know, pick and choose what you liked uh, within that subspecialist. So those things attracted to me about um, cardiology. Yeah. I asked that question just because I've met other cardiologists who, who said that what attracted them to it was like, there was a certain event in their life. So like for me, for example, my dad passed away in April of 2010, like three weeks before I graduated college, uh, mm-hmm. 47 years old, had a massive heart attack. The old, the old yeah. widow maker, as they say. So yeah. thinking about, you know, the, the I mean, Simplifying it to heart attack, complexualizing it to myocardial infarction, right? That, that whole thing. But can you explain well, one, this is kind of for me, but also for some of the listeners, like what happens to the heart in that space? Because when that happened, my first thought was like, man, I want to learn everything about heart attacks and how all that works and how do I yeah. prevent it myself? How do I help others? <laughs> that was my first thought. And so I didn't, yeah. I didn't know if there was some type of event that was like the heart is where I'm going. <laughs> yeah. I would say not, not in one, and not certainly not like your story, or not in one massive uh, way. But, but I would just say it. It always interested me. Interested me because it was explainable. Like there are many oh. things in medicine that we don't have a lot of knowledge around. I mean, we know a lot of things, but oftentimes we're just scratching the surface in certain fields. And there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of I don't know. There's a lot of mechanisms that we're like and I still don't know how that works or why that happens. And still that exists in cardiology too, but a lot of them have been elucidated, a lot of pathways, a lot of understanding. And so I felt like when I was speaking to patients, what I, what I got really good at and what, what really attracted me to it is that over time, I got an understanding of taking these sort of complex mechanisms and distilling it down into a uh, very understandable way for people so that in in the interactions that I have with with patients and families, hopefully, and oftentimes they say this, they, they leave understanding in a much more comprehensive way what has happened, what is going to happen, as much as we can predict, and how can they how can they empower themselves to hopefully improve their likelihood or lower their risks or or take better care of themselves. In the end, that's my function as a physician. It's not to do this procedure or give this medicine or do the, it's to impart knowledge. It's to take this sort of very complex data set of, of science, research, and, and their own data and take it all, put it all together and give it to them in a very understandable way. And that's what I got really good at over the last decade plus of doing this. And, and that's what people really appreciate because that's, 
pretty much why people, mm -hmm. we all go to physicians. We, we want knowledge. We want answers. And, and sometimes the answer is we really don't know, and that's fine, but at least that there's an answer. And so that there's some sort of clarity around that. And that's, that can be done in cardiology versus a lot of other specialties. It's just, a, I'm not sure why this happens, but it happens. And here's this medicine that helps. So that makes sense. H have you always been good at that? Cause I mean, that's definitely a skill. That's something that, that I do on my side of business, you know, with grand vision capital and uh, working with physicians from an investment standpoint, you know, a lot of them know a little bit about real estate, but there's, there's some education around real estate, but a lot of it is the strategies. Like how do we pay less taxes? How do we create passive income? How do we, you know, offset this or do that? That can get very complex, right? On the, on the finance side of things. And so I would agree with you o over the last, let's call it 14, 15 years of my career, I have gotten better at taking something complex and simplifying it for those so that it's understandable. Do you, do you feel like that's something that, is that a muscle that you kind of have built over your career or have, have you just always been good at that? I've been, I think that was, a, that was one of my, uh, in, I would say skills going into medicine. And that's kind of what I, I sort of felt that without clearly identifying it. Sure. And then it just got much better over time and with practice as it always does. And so, yeah, that I would say that that is probably one of doing that and doing that with empathy and, and uh, compassion is really my primary skill set. Honestly, <laughs> you know, I'm not I'm not honestly like the I was good enough at procedures, but it was never really an interest or talent of mine. I certainly wasn't good at research or understanding very complex sort of research questions, or at least I didn't have the patience or um, mindset <laughs> to do that. And, yeah, I'm sure you can and, come up with a question. It was just the, yeah, I a lot of questions, do I want to find like the answer? Doing the research, uh, boy, that was challenging for me. And, and I never really got, you know, in medicine, sometimes there are, there are avenues to get super specialized where you can be doing one procedure as your primary sort of job. I never really liked that. I, I viewed procedures, imaging tool, just tools. They're just tools to help me gather data and to help people either understand their disease or to, to identify it and define it better. That's all I viewed it as and, and still do. And so, yeah, that, I think that's my primary, that's my primary um, skill as a physician. For sure. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot then and, and have you explain something complex in a very simple way in like 30 seconds. So explain how, what happens to the heart when you're having a heart attack? There's a sudden loss of blood flow, generally. There are many types of heart attacks, but most commonly when people say heart attack, what they really are meaning is that there is for some reason, and there are different mechanisms, there's sudden loss of blood flow to the heart muscle, and therefore loss of oxygen, and therefore cells die. And that's what a heart attack is. And that comes with all the cholesterol, and, and there's essentially a blockage in an artery that's that stops that blood flow into the heart? That's one of the most common reasons, mm -hmm. but there are multiple other reasons that that happens. Sometimes it can be due to a sudden blood clot rather than plaque. It can be due to a spasm of the artery where an artery has muscle in it. And there, for some reason, that muscle spasms uh, erroneously and shuts down blood supply just as a blockage or a plaque would. There are mechanisms where the heart is beating so fast for other reasons in an arrhythmia, perhaps that there's no blockage there, but the heart is beating so fast that it's demanding so much blood that the vessels just can't keep up. Also same, same idea. So there's multiple mechanisms, but what most commonly people mean when they say a sudden heart attack, it usually means a sudden plaque and, and or clot uh, or combination of both that shuts down blood flow to a certain part of the heart muscle. So there's lots of mechanisms there, but that's the most common, uh, most commonly understood. For sure. What do you share with patients as far as being not reactive, but proactive? So let's say cardi not just heart attack, but cardiovascular disease in general, if it's genetic or if it's, you know, maybe they've had some, some tests done where it shows, Hey, you, you've got, you know, a 90% blockage going on. Like if, if you don't take care of this and, and do the right things, this yeah. could progress. What are some of those things that you tell patients to, to be proactive against that? So there's always probably two parts to it because still medicine today is extremely reactive. 
we're almost mm -hmm. always reacting to something, reacting to symptoms, reacting to, I feel like there's some problem reacting to a test result that was done that usually was prompted by mm -hmm. something else. So we're almost in always in reactive phase, especially in cardiology. So what I have, what I usually do is you got to take care of the, the, the stuff that's going to cause some problem soon. So the acute stuff. So if somebody's having a heart attack, you got to take care of the heart attack. You got to take care of that. You got to be reactive. You got to do what, what is necessary to kind of stabilize the person and get them to a place where we have at least have time to talk further. And that we always do. That's, that's typically what I would say the majority of, of cardiology is today. It's all react, almost all reactive, but then always after that initial reactive phase, people come back into the office or sitting there after a procedure in the hospital and saying, okay, we fixed this, this near term problem, or at least stabilized it. Usually I don't use the word fixed, stabilize the near term problem. Mm -hmm. Now what? Now, how do you prevent it from happening again? How do you prevent it from something else happening? How do you prevent, prevent some complication occurring? Then you start talking about being proactive. And, and really the way I talk to people is that it's a partnership. Some of it I can bring to the table with recommendations of medications, cardiac rehab, uh, lifestyle interventions that are recommended, but the majority of it actually falls on the person themselves. What are they going to do in their life? Uh, whether it's lifestyle, whether it's diet, whether it's smoking cessation, exercise, blood pressure control, uh, almost all those things are in their hands. Now, I can help them, but really it's up to them. And so really making sure that they see it that way as a partnership. That's the first thing that, that people have to understand that it is, it's not just their, within their power, it's their responsibility. That's, you know, they, they, you, they can't expect it to be given to them. So that's a, that's a change, shift in mindset because people generally often look at healthcare system and saying, well, I have this problem. You tell me what I need to do and then I'll do it or I'll take this medicine or I'll do this thing. Uh, but it's always in that, in that way, it's always been directed from health system or healthcare organization physicians to the patients. But really it's actually the, in the, to be proactive and to be preventive, it's the opposite that the, the person has to be in charge and they're the ones that are really driving their own care. And so making sure that they're, my job is to make sure they're empowered with knowledge, empowered with tools and make sure that they know that I'm available to help them on an ongoing basis, not just once a year or once every six months. And when people do that, when people really do take charge themselves, that's when they're the most successful and success doesn't mean everything goes well. That's the, also the, the thing that people quite don't quite always grasp in medicine and in healthcare, the definition of health is, is complex and it's different from one person to the other. For some people, it could just be staying, mean staying out of the hospital for the next year. That's a definition of success for that person. For others, it could mean never having a, uh, never needing a procedure, surgery, or having an event. Those are two wildly different definitions of success, but for each individual person, that could be their primary thing that they need to, they need to, you know, that they care about and I care about and that we do together. So sort of contextualizing it for their own life and where they are in life, what is definition of success? That's very different. And, and unlike almost everything else we buy with you know, consumer or yeah, almost everything else. People who patients specifically who are, and all of us are going to be patients at one time or another who are in the healthcare system. It's very hard to define what is the definition of success? What am I purchasing with my healthcare dollars? What am I trying to achieve? People don't know. It's really hard to say. We can all say, well, we generally want to be healthy, but uh, when something happens or when there or there's a fear of some specific event, those definitions don't apply anymore. Then it becomes very much for that person's, you know, disease or worry or concern. And then for that person's life, what is success and making that clear to them is really, I think it's really helpful because then people can understand that the definition of success isn't to live to I'm 120. It may not even be to live to I'm, uh, 90, 
maybe the definition of success is just I, that I don't have that surgery or I, ha I need that surgery, I get it, and then I don't ever need anything again in terms of procedures. These are all kind of very personal. Absolutely, that's a great answer. Yeah, that's a great answer. I always think about kind of the opposite of success then, the, the people who have the reluctance, uh, who have the apprehension to, to make the changes maybe that you would be recommending. What do you tell those type of people? Do you kind of go, and this probably isn't the physician way, do you kind of go doomsday? Like, if you don't do this, here's what can happen. Do you go from, hey, I just explained something to you in a very simple way. Now I'm going to really make it a little bit more complex. So it like really drives home like this is more serious than the, the simple way that I just explained it to you. What's, what's the physician mindset there of like, you give some great feedback, you give great direction. You say, hey, this yeah. is in your hands. I'm here with you. We're excited to do it together. And they're just like, yeah. nah, I just, I don't really want to make any, any of those changes. Yeah. Where do you go there? So this is where being a human being is really important. You yes. can't figure that out without being a human being. And this is why, I don't know, and maybe in the future people will say chat GPT or AI will replace me, uh, may replace you, I don't know. But in medicine, I have a hard time believing that because what you just said, or that question you just asked, is entirely about who is that person sitting across from you and how are they going to receive the message that you want them to receive? And it's every time it's different. So some people, if they're sort of non-responding, like, like you kind of gave that scenario, some people need a kick in the head. Mm -hmm. Others need a very compassionate approach saying, give me your hand, we'll walk through this together. Some others just need data and lots of it. And they're like, they don't, and that's how their mind works. And that's what really turns them on into sort of being proactive for themselves. And there are many, many other sort of variations of all those themes. And you won't know which one that is until you understand that person as a human being. And that's the essence of medicine. That's the essence of being a doctor. Uh, it's not about data crunching and it's not about, you know, doing a procedure. All those are great and having the data is great, but to get that person to be empowered and make change themselves, you have to understand that person directly and, and internally. So it takes time sometimes. Sometimes you get it very quickly. Sometimes it's pretty clear. Sometimes the person says, this is what I need to know to be able to make change. Other times it's really difficult, very challenging. And the person just doesn't respond, doesn't respond. And oftentimes, sometimes, physicians and healthcare that write people off. They say, well, that person's just not going to change. But generally that means that there hasn't been a good enough connection. It's usually not that the person doesn't want to change or just doesn't care that that happens, but it's pretty rare. Most of the time it's that we're talking here and the person is up here and they're not in a position to hear what, what we're saying. So you have to make those align. You have to mm -hmm. figure out how is that person going to hear in their own way what the message I'm trying to get across? So sometimes that has to do with pictures. I drew a lot, I draw a lot of pictures because people are visual. Sometimes it has to do with complex data and like especially engineers come with their Excel worksheets and they're like, okay, here's the data, therefore you can draw a line. <laughs> and then others just just honestly, others just need a hug. And that's seriously the truth. Like sometimes that they can't hear what you're saying until you stop, hold their hand or give them a hug. Mm -hmm. And then they'll just, they're sort of just, mm -hmm. and then they, and then they can start hearing it. Then they're ready um, to receive the information. Yeah. And then they're ready to receive. So yeah. it's amazing. It the parallels of which is why and, and, I think, and finance, you know, AI won't replace me at least for another five years. Yeah, I was saying it's amazing the the parallels between medicine and finance. Everything you described, like when I was a financial advisor, those were all things you you have to kind of figure out through some very intentional questioning. You know, is this a logic based decision maker? Is this an emotion based decision maker? What do they need from me? Do they need all of the information at once? Do they need to it kind of trickled in? Yeah, uh, you're right. There are times when people just they need kind of that tough love, yeah. but that's also how they learn things. And there's other people that 
need love. Like they need that hug right. that says, Hey, yeah. we're, we're going to get through this and we're, and we're going to be okay. And it's, I'm yeah. sure there's many other industries that that's, that's true for, but like, yeah, as you were describing how you would handle those situations, I'm like, Holy cow, that's exactly how someone <laughs> in finance might do it as well. Cause I mean, we are just human beings, right? We all yeah. have needs. We all have emotions. We all have uh, decisions to make. And so the, the ability to understand the person across the desk from you and, and, how they're going to receive the information because you you probably have a preferred way of delivering that information but you also have to be cognizant of how are they going to receive it based on who they are and that's 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 something that i think a lot of patients don't think that physicians are doing right they that's just right. think physician comes in he gives me the information i have to kind of sort it out myself and figure it figure out how i'm going to do it well somebody who yeah. says that probably didn't have a very good physician when they were growing up or they had a poor experience in the past to say, yeah, physicians are all just hard nosed and, and dry and they just, they throw it at me and, and I have to try and figure it out myself. Good physicians like you will sit down and understand someone to see how, how are they going to receive this information? What do they need to know? Do they need to know, you know, how the clock works or do they just want to know what time it is? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So looking at the timeline of your career, you came out of Washington University fellowship program around 2012, correct? That's uh, right. Yep. Then came the Portland Clinic. So were you right into seeing patients right away while being a medical director? Was that kind of a, a dual role? Yeah. Talk me through how that all worked out. Cause I, I looked in the Portland Clinic. It is a, it's a big operation and, yeah. and to, to now talk to the guy who kind of got that thing going and it built it up to nearly 600 employees is is quite impressive. So how'd you juggle that coming out of St. Louis? Right. Well, to be, to be clear, so Portland clinic is a long, uh, it has an old history. So it had been there a long time. Oh, okay. But when I came to it, they, they had no, they were not doing any cardiology work. My first job out of fellowship was to work primarily, uh, within the umbrella organization, but to basically start the cardiovascular service line and business from scratch. And it was, we had started with two EKG machines and a medical assistant and some, yeah, that was it. <laughs> and so, and so then, you know, I had some infrastructure, at least like building space and some, some backing of the clinic, but essentially was to, to really build a, a cardiology service business. And so, yeah, I, mean, I started seeing patients from day one and then in tandem started building the actual uh, practice. Uh, the seeing patients is sort of one part of it, but you need a lot of other ancillary sort of services to really make a fully functional cardiovascular service line. And so sort of had to build the ultrasound labs, build a vascular lab, you know, hire staff, so manage staff, negotiate for hard equipment to do, you know, cost effective analysis to, and do real estate uh, sort of analysis to make sure that we were uh, being wise about our spending and and so forth. So it took some years, honestly, as and and a lot of a lot of hard work, uh, truthfully, it was very difficult um, to build it. Um, but it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I mean, I learned so many different things about sort of uh, setting up a business, you know, everything from par levels for IV tubing to uh, negotiating for contrast prices from manufacturers to buying echo machines to uh, hiring and managing staff and building a team that was really high, highly functional. And so I had a lot of fun doing it. And then as I was having success with the cardiovascular service line, then the clinic asked me to do more leadership for the overall clinic. And so then, you know, being on the executive board and really having input into all the functions, all the departments, uh, doing some pretty major real estate deals, uh, contracts with other health uh, payers, major health payers in the market, all kinds of those things, you know, happened as well. So it was a it was a really interesting and fun experience. Of course, building my practice was the sort of core part of it, but it had all these other uh, aspects uh, over the seven years that I was there. So a few different hats you had to wear. It, it sounds like over your time there, did you enjoy? Where did you find more fulfillment? Is what I want to ask. I guess in, in the building process and you know ordering EKGs and and figuring out all the all the different real estate aspects or was it on kind of that leadership role that you took on kind of in those later years there 
where you know the dust had kind of settled on the building process and then now it's just managing the people and and making sure that that's a well-oiled machine my favorite was always the building mm -hmm. uh always has been and i think of the things it wasn't really the the equipment or the infrastructure that i really get excited about it was the people the team and and i think that was the probably the thing i learned the best and I and I happen to do at least reasonably well there. I think really well, to be honest, is because of the success of the team it made the success of the department, and it wouldn't have been possible without him. There's, everyone knows this who's run a team or run a business. And so we started with you know two or th two people, three people. We ended up with like fifteen, which is a big department for that that kind of practice, and. And it was so high functioning that honestly, of all the places I've been to, uh, Mayo Clinic and Mass General and Washington University and all the places that I've worked, that was the highest functioning, best team that I've ever worked with. And, uh, and, and they really did it. And we did it on a minimal budget as compared to all these other places. And that was, was sort of a testament to the people that, that were there and uh, their willingness and ability to to really rise uh, and increase their skill set, which is what exactly happened, because the Portland Clinic was a place that they allowed that to happen too. There were not as many restrictions as a lot of these larger corporate entities, so it allowed good teams to to up level their game, and without sort of rules to say no, you can't do this because of X, Y, and Z reasons, or no, this union blocks this, or whatever. Whatever the rules are at larger entities didn't exist there. So we were really allowed to to be creative, to innovate, um, solve our own problems, and uh, and if, I found that if you give good people the training and the trust, almost always they will surpass your expectations. One hundred percent. Where did you acquire this acumen to do it? Were you just kind of learning on the go? Because I know, like, within medical school, within residency, within your fellowship they're not teaching some of those business, the business aspects of medicine. So no. were you kind of learning on the go or did you acquire this knowledge out, outside of this? Where, where did that come from? Well, you're right. So medical schools uh, and universities don't teach any of this. And I think it's a really big gap. Now they're starting to become more aware of that, I think as a whole, but are struggling to figure out how to, how to bring that into the school itself. And, and that's some of the work that I'm trying to do with some of the universities that I'm involved with now is to really help impart some of this knowledge uh, onto the future generations of medicine, because we need physician leaders and innovators in all aspects of healthcare. And there are major gaps where we don't have enough of that. But to answer your question, no, I learned all that on the go. Um, <laughs> there was no, no course or no sort of nothing I... I just learned it as I as I went through it, which is probably no better way of learning it uh, other than to just try and do and certainly failed uh, sometimes or did something, you know, improperly or incorrectly or in a way that was probably not optimal. But again, you know, going back to this, the foundation of our team, our team was such that when when we made mistakes or when we saw that there were problems in how we were doing things, we recognized it quickly and and it got to the point where it was running so smoothly and so well and everyone had the the trust, they knew they had my trust as the medical director that they would come to me like this, Dr. Shah, and I'd be sitting there seeing in between patients typing my note. This would happen in like two minutes. They would come to me and say, Dr. Shah, we've identified there's a problem with our intake. Here's the problem. Here's why it's happening. We've identified three strategies to fix it. We think this strategy is the best. We're going to implement it tomorrow if you agree. Do you agree? And I would just nod. I would just be like, yes. And that's it. And then they would just go Trust. and do it. And when that happened, I was like, okay. This is a great team. <laughs> We're really doing well. So, uh, and so that was that was the sort of when that moment happened, and that happened probably like four years in, or so, or three years maybe. Uh, and when that happened, I, I then I knew that this was a great team, and we were, you know, pretty much unstoppable. You had a lot of doers, not a lot of followers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
We sure did. Because the followers would have showed up and been like, hey, our intake is not working. What do you think we should do to fix it? And then just that's stand right. there and wait for yeah. a complex answer from you. And yeah. Oh, that's. Yeah. Or I, I may not have had the right answer. That's <laughs> oftentimes they would ask me and I'm like, wow, I, I'm not sure what to do about that. And then they would tell me, well, we should do it like this. We think this is the best way that, and I would just say, yeah, that sounds great. Why don't you try it and reevaluate in a month and see if it's working. And so we would have this constant iteration. And I think that was really, really helpful. We never got stuck in some pattern that we couldn't get out of, or we're just wedded to some way of doing things. And I think that's, you know, that speaks volumes about, well, for, first of all, the size of the organization and, and it was relatively nimble mm -hmm. and also sort of just not having an entrenched mentality, I think was probably the biggest thing along with the people themselves. For sure. I mean, you put together the combination of, of great people, uh, the autonomy, it sounds like Portland clinic gave you guys to, to really grow that there's no reason it shouldn't have been a powerhouse, right? It, like it, it just, it was kind of that perfect combination and the, and the perfect uh, ingredients and, and recipe to, to make something great. Absolutely. So then the Mayo Clinic calls, they want a thoracic aortic disease program. They give you a call. Is, is that the dream job? You know, the, I got to imagine, and there's probably different levels with it, you know, kind of that Harvard prestige name that we were talking about. Then you have the yeah. Mayo Clinic, which, which, which is a big deal. Obviously I'm here in Iowa. There's a big one up in Rochester, Minnesota that, that most people sure. in the Midwest go to. That is a quite impressive complex they have up there. But yep. tell me about that call. Was that kind of the dream job? And, and were you able to fluidly take all the information that you learned at, at the Portland Clinic and, and apply that then at the Mayo Clinic? Well, so we certainly, when we had, were you know, invited to go down and, and, and build something and take this job, we, we certainly thought that this was, this was a great, how, how could this be? It has all the reputation and branding of Mayo Clinic. And in some ways, in many ways, it was, it, you know, it's, they have a great facilities. They have like no cost is spared. They, they, mm -hmm. you know, go all out for the patients and the, and the, and the patient experience is great. I think thought that I guess that there's, there would be avenues for me to bring all this knowledge and experience and sort of innovate in the same ways, but now within the structure of, of a larger organization like Mayo Clinic. And what I found was, is just like every other large organization, there were just limitations on how much you could really be creative and how much you could innovate. And, and I think that there was nothing wrong with the Mayo Clinic that there was, it has all the great parts about it, but they have a set method. They have a way, they call it the Mayo way. And it's, and it's good for many things. But if, if you, come in and imagine you're going to try to really disrupt things and do things differently. Even if you're setting up something anew, I think that that was, that just, you know, was discordant with, with what their expectations were. And I understand that now. And so one of the, one of the things that I realized after I had gone there is that, you know, long-term I was feeling like there was some stagnation for me. There wasn't as much growth as I wanted there to be. And so that was really the reason I started looking elsewhere to do something else. And at, as well, aside from Mayo Clinic itself, you know, I'd been in practice then now 14 years full time, you know, and, and very much full time, not like a few days a week, but seven days a week for seven years in Portland and, and then, you know, full time at Mayo Clinic. And so I was looking to try something different. So that led me down a different pathway. But it did tell me that, you know, a smaller company with the ability to wear more hats, to be more nimble, to be, to be disruptive and creative was really where I needed to be. And, and less a large, you know, established organization that had been around a long time and had certain ways of doing things. And I think that's really what I learned from that. And, you know, I really enjoyed my time at Mayo Clinic. I learned a lot, certainly around aortic disease and um, got some great colleagues. But I think long term, it didn't fulfill some of those uh, needs that I that I really was looking for. Absolutely. And, and for everyone listening, that's a good, powerful message and, and something to be mindful of as, as you're moving around within your careers. It, it goes back to that recipe, you know, that I was mentioning a, a second ago, you had a great recipe at Portland of, of a great team, you had the autonomy, you had the, uh, the ability to expand right? There was no limitation. There was no restriction. Uh, it sounds like you had that at, at your next venture. 
and then now moving to Actia, I'm, I'm guessing that the move to Actia was very similar in the sense of you knew that there was going to be a, autonomy. You knew there was going to be a team that was thriving is the word that comes to mind, but I, I want to say eager, like they're, yeah. they're eager to, to really grow this thing and expand and see how big you can take it. So tell me about the move to Actia. What I mentioned a medical device company within, within the bio at the beginning, but what's your day-to-day -day look like there as a, as a chief medical officer, what are you guys working on? Yeah, so Actia is a Swiss company, and so it's a globally distributed uh, workforce, but it's a startup. So it's some 40 some people uh, who are working on it. And, and the founders are Swiss and biomedical engineers and have developed a sort of a, a wearable technology for continuous blood pressure monitoring, which is completely you know novel. It's been tried many times, but no one's quite been able to get it to work the way the way they have. And it's been commercialized in Europe or two years, two, two plus years now. And, you know, we hope to bring it to the U.S. Uh, fairly soon. But the to answer your question, so my, my role as chief medical officer within a startup, within a sort of medical device, globally distributed startup, is not at all what the job description was <laughs> when, uh, when, when I applied or when I saw it on LinkedIn. Ra basically now, day to day, uh, it's a very high level role in multiple different functions. So in commercialization, business development and partnerships, I have a lead, uh, lead role, um, strategy, fundraising, um, product design and development, uh, R and D or R and T and regulatory. So basically, I guess I would best explain it as bringing, taking all this clinical background and experience that I've had over the last two decades, and now bringing that experience into a medical device startup where I am one of the only or really one of the very few people with true healthcare experience. Mm. And so bringing those experiences now to product design and how do we develop partnerships and what are the right partnerships to de develop and how do we design a regulatory strategy and what's our R&D strategy and what's our clinical trial strategy? All of those things need input from somebody who has relevant real world experience. And this is what I was saying before about how physician innovators and leaders are desperately needed in these spaces, not just in startups, but even in large companies that are doing uh, large strategic companies that are that are existing. And they already have some physicians, but they need that real world experience because they're trying to solve problems in healthcare. They need to know what the problems are. And they need to know whether their solutions that they're creating are relevant for the problems that they that they think they see. And that only can happen if you have someone who actually does does it day to day. And so it's been a great experience. And that's that's really so I do many different things within the company, but uh, it's been a tremendous learning experience. Yeah, I mean, the just as an entrepreneur as well, I, I agree with you when you said earlier, like the team is everything. But then I think to these uh, these biomedical engineers that are sitting there thinking, okay, we want to monitor blood pressure. We want it to be a wearable device. We know the engineering side of this and how it works, how it will make those readings. But then that's all we know, right? And so like, yeah. where do we go from there? Then, then it's you yeah. know, then it's a marketing team, then it's a sales team. But then it's like, well, how do we know if this thing's going to translate well in the in the healthcare space? Like, is this right. going to be received well? And so I think a uh, fantastic move out of them to, to hire someone like you, who not only has the, the clinical side of things, you know, in the cardiovascular space, but also to the business side of things and everything that you learned, you know, at Portland and at Mayo and uh, along the way, that was yeah. a great move by them. So that was my, that was my promotion and my, uh, you know, giving you your, your kudos and your high five. But uh, you I, I think yeah. it's, it's just, uh, it's complex, you know, startups are hard. And, and so I think it's, it's exciting to be in that space and, and to have the chief medical officer role, but it sounds like you also have seven other hats that I think you mentioned. Yeah. And so where do you see that going in the next five years? Cause I, cause I see a, a wearable device. I think of like my Apple watch, right. That, that can read my pulse and, and tell me those things. Is it similar to that? Or is this going to be more to our point earlier, the reactive phase of like someone who has had blood pressure issues, you now need to use Actia's device? Well, it's hard to see five years ahead, especially in a small startup. Let's look one year. So I don't, 
yeah so sort of the reality of what it is now it's it's where we think all about blood pressure now blood pressure is the most high blood pressure is the most common disease in the world 1.4 billion people in the world have it 130 million americans have it and it's the primary risk factor a cause of death in the world by far so that certainly has many applications to people who have high blood pressure but at the same time although we know a lot of things about high blood pressure and how to treat it we're really bad at it medicine in general we have a control rate across the world meaning people who have high blood pressure who are at goal blood pressure 20 percent one in five and in the u.s it's 26 percent. so we're really bad at it even though we know very well how to manage it and we know a lot of things about how to uh, lower the risk so it speaks to the lack of the ability and, and the design of healthcare organizations to take what is a very common wide scale chronic disease and really modify it that's what the that's where the lack is and an ability to measure and monitor in an easy way is one part of it for sure but it's not the only part and and sort of we think about taking these you know the technological innovation that has that our founders have developed and applying it wide scale global uh, and really putting that data and ability to change and empowering patients and ability to change their own lifestyle and and blood pressure in their own hands because healthcare systems are not designed to manage hundreds of millions of people and they never will be unless something drastically changes, which is not likely to happen in the near future. And so that's how we think about high blood pressure. But we also know that there are many hidden signals and now in this complex data set that we create. For the first time, we're looking at data sets of many thousands of measurements over a month or two for the first time. And we don't know, we barely are starting to understand what signals are contained within those data. So instead of just looking at blood pressure as high or normal, or 138 over 82 in millimeters of mercury, we're looking at patterns, we're looking at trends. And I think this, this is what the, the fundamental innovation here of this sort of continuous monitoring is that the data set that you can look at and build for blood pressure has never been seen before. So now we're starting to take these complex data and pair it with health outcomes data and and imaging data and biomarker data and genetics data, genomics data, so we can start to understand these patterns in a much more profound way. And I think that the future, and we've seen this with continuous glucose monitors uh, over the last 20 years, is that the future state of blood pressure, I think, will not involve just high, low, normal millimeters of mercury. It'll have metrics that we have not even yet developed. Um, we don't even know the names of them yet, uh, based on this sort of foundational data. I think that's the real power of it. And this is a medical device with medical grade technology and medical data. So no, we, we don't really want to be just a, a wearable competitor to some consumer electronic company. Mm -hmm. uh, we can, we know we can get the same signals from many different devices. So not to say that we couldn't use other third party devices to get our same data. So we don't see ourselves as a hardware business long term but that the real key is in the data sets that we can create and the insights that we can deliver across a wide range of people across the world and i think that's never been done before and that's the aspiration of of our company and even though we're a tiny startup that's what that's what startups are built on uh, foundational sort of completely game-changing world-changing ideas Absolutely. Well, let's talk about that innovation because as you were talking there and giving a great uh, answer as, as far as the synopsis of what it is, my thought then goes to, okay, if, if it's not the kind of the instantaneous, you know, I could look down at my Apple watch and it can tell me what my pulse and blood pressure is. What I'm hearing you say is it, it's going to be a continuing continuous monitoring device to help build data. So let's say Actia has a million users that are all using this device. You guys are gathering data. You have subset data of, you know, here's these types of people in Switzerland versus Italy versus Canada versus South America. 
they're all wearing this device. They all have different body types, different ages, different backgrounds, but you're gathering all this data and subset data based on blood pressure to then in a more broad scope, come up with solutions to, to get people to normal, to, to be able to balance and to be able to try well, to find insights to, to stabilize no, a, it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so we know, I mean, clinicians see this all the time. Someone has a blood pressure of 140 over 90 in clinic or that one time measurement, let's say at home. And the two people, let's say two people have that same measurement. One person has a dramatic event, heart attack, stroke, something at age 60. The other person lives to 90. Why? We have no idea. I don't know. Sometimes it's genetics. Sometimes it's their lifestyle. Sometimes we don't know those things, but we know blood pressure is a primary input into cardiovascular disease. So maybe those two people with 140 over 90, the blood pressures are not equal. So even understanding, even the definition of blood pressure, what's high, what's normal, what's, what is their, that I think should change also. It should be more complex, more about their pattern, more about how much time are they spending in an optimal range uh, or, or sort of signals that we see in their complex, you know, continuous pattern. Those are things that we're barely starting to understand. And we have to do a significant amount of research to start peeling back the layers of these data. But I think that's really where the, that's really where the possibility lies in understanding that someone who has apparently normal blood pressure on their one-time reading may actually be at significantly higher risk based on the complex data set. And so the idea of doing one-time blood pressure readings and making assessments on those episodic readings, I think is flawed. We all kind of know it's flawed, but yeah, it's just- Somebody could never be nervous a... in the clinic. Yeah, somebody could be just like, ah, I'm all just really things. nervous to be in a doctor's yeah. office and- you know, all those things we just don't have we've never had a tool that's widely available for people to look at their blood pressure in a much more continuous way it's always been one-time episodic reading that's how that's the foundation of all our knowledge of blood pressure because that's how cuffs have been developed and that's what they do and that's fine and that, that's they're good enough as to what where we've gotten today so the next stage in discovery and the way we get there, and I, I use this term meant for Actia, is the vehicle for discovery and blood pressure for the future is is this type of technology. Yeah, this will be a physician recommended device then, right? They have a 60 year old that's experiencing high blood pressure or, you know, different events, you know, fainting and things like that. And so it's like, hey, we're, Actia has a great device. We're gonna have you wear this, continuing mo continuous monitoring we're going to be watching this and, and gathering data and, and coming up with some, some future recommendations. Is, is that the thought? It doesn't have to be. It, so certainly already in, in our current markets, yeah, some physicians recommend it, but it's, it's direct, it's sold over the counter as all blood pressure products are. So people can access it, whether or not a physician recommends it to manage and, and sort of look at their own data. And so it, it doesn't rely only on, uh, on that sort of physician recommendation or prescription. It's not a prescription product. Gotcha. As a startup, is this something that's available now? Is there a, a, a release date? What does that look like for this device? Well, in Europe, it's available now in, in seven countries. And we have access with our regulatory approval now uh, to 40 plus. We just have, you know, have to balance our resources about how we expand to them. In the US, we are looking to get into the US market um, obviously, that means going through the FDA, and so that's a lengthy and, and significant process that we hope to get through by the end of this year to early next year. Awesome. Well, what is next for Dr. Jay Shaw in 2024? As, as you look out over the next 12 months, what are yeah. big things that are going on for you? What do people need to know about? Well, certainly, I'm going to continue my work with Actia. It's, it's, a, it's been a great journey, and, and it's I think you know has the potential to go much farther. The 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 other main focus for me is sort of on my personal side is is really uh, I think taking now all this knowledge uh, and my own career journey and trying to bring that back and give it to physicians who are maybe earlier in their careers or later it doesn't necessarily matter and certainly medical students and and folks in training and so uh, I'm looking to sort of broaden my message to to help those individuals to see all the different possibilities of a career in medicine 
and it doesn't have to be linear and it doesn't have to be focused on one thing for 30 years and that and that we need desperately need uh, physician leaders and innovators in startups in industry in strategic in pharma in all the ancillary healthcare leadership itself all needs significant physician innovation so I'm trying to take that message and and really uh, be available to other physicians and maybe you know build something around that. God, well, man, that was going to be my last question, but now you've opened my brain up to a few more. If if you got time for it, sure. Uh, yeah. Have you started like a consulting firm of some sort that where you're going out and going to these different entities and and talking about this this change? No, that I haven't. Made? Not so much consulting, but I certainly, I mean, have been you know, open with providing lots of advice to people who are interested physicians. But I think what I've been trying to get into is is basically in medical education and uh, an early stage career development and trying to really talk to, uh, I have already been talking to some medical schools and residency programs, and I would not, I'd like to uh, make that a much more common theme so that people understand early when they're in school, medical school, when they're in training and residency or fellowship, that it's it's good to have clinical practice. Good to you need to do that to really be relevant. But there are many other aspects to a career in medicine that you can do in tandem with practicing medicine, and ideally you do both. And and traditionally there's been a very, I would say, limited options for people to kind of pursue in medicine, either you research or you're in clinical practice or some version of either. academia. Yeah, yeah academics uh, or in private practice, but practicing medicine. And I think we're seeing the dissatisfaction on a grand scale of physicians doing that. And certainly in the last decade or two, it's and it's only accelerating. 10% of the physician workforce left the practice of medicine last year, 10% the year before that, oh. and it's not being replaced. And, and I think that's because people are looking for something else that's, that, uh, that isn't being provided by their traditional practice of medicine. And I, I want to, you know, I'm an example of how, what is possible. And I want to you know, say, it's not the only thing, but I want to sort of impart that knowledge or at least help people understand how they can at least look themselves and what is possible and how do you look and where do you look and how do you make yourself tri shift and transition when all we've been trained to do is you know clinical work or research so there's lots of opportunity there and um i want to be able to empower physicians to do that it's a very complex problem um yeah. that that this topic is 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 one of the simple solutions to provide business classes, finance classes within medical school, within pre-med degrees? Is, is that part of it? Just kind of get people's eyes open as they're in those formidable years of, uh, of medical education to, yeah. to understand, hey, I, I, I love medicine. I want to help people. But there mm -hmm. is a business side to this. There is a finance side to this. There are things that I need to know to help me accelerate my success. Do you think that's, a, is that a simple solution to it? Or is that complex also? I think it's, I wouldn't say it's necessarily simple or complex. I think it's more holistic. So there are some, some schools that are already doing some business and medicine classes or finance literacy type classes. I think those are still fairly rudimentary and, and they're sort of components of a much more holistic approach that I, that I would espouse, which is, yes, you need to have some financial literacy. Yes, you need to understand some aspects of, of business and medicine. But then where are you going to apply them? How are you going to take that knowledge? How are you going to gain more once you leave that class or that school? Where are you going to understand in a deeper way the sort of complexities of healthcare and your role in it? And how can you change it? Or how can you be more of, a, of your own agent of change? And, and there are so many ways, small and large, that someone can do this. And it doesn't necessarily have to be some massive job that you can post on LinkedIn and have a bazillion followers. It doesn't have to be that way. I mean, some of the most impactful things that I've done have been small scale, but they feel really good and they're really empowering to me and my patients. And if you can create that microcosm for yourself or your, your group, great. 
you know, maybe that's the, that's the way you're going to enjoy practicing medicine. So I think that there's a lot there in terms of, uh, you know, what those possibilities are. But I think you have to look at it in a more holistic fashion than, than typically is done. Absolutely. Well, great way to end the show. I, I appreciate all your time, Jay, and, and taking some time away, away from your family to, to hang out and talk with me. All right. Wishing you nothing but the best in, in 2024 and, and Actia's growth and your growth uh, as a provider. I hope our paths cross at some point in the future. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me, Nate. It's pretty, been a pleasure. You bet. All right. Be well. Thank you.